Amen. Praise God. But what we've been talking about is the new life that we have in Jesus and not just the fact that we're forgiven and we're given a brand new start and we have a brand new hope and a new peace, a new spirit and a new destiny. Amen? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you believe in Him and you believe in the finished work on Calvary for your sins. The Bible says you are born again. You are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. And some sweet day, we're going to see Jesus face to face. No tears, no sorrow, no parting. It's been a lot of death happen, happening in our society, in our families. But there's a day coming where the final enemy, death, will be defeated once and forevermore. And so we rejoice in that. In fact, Paul, I was going to say he had a weird, but it wasn't weird, it was godly. He had a weird perspective on, on death. To me, for, to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain, or to die is better. He couldn't wait to pass from this life to the next life because he knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that that life, the life that was waiting for him was immeasurably better than the life that he was living as glorious and as powerful as it was. Although he also had a number of, of struggles and challenges. In fact, Paul himself wrote that I hath not seen nor ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. And so those are all great and wonderful things, promises that we should live in, that should give us great joy and assurance that we've already made it. You know, we've already crossed the finish line if we've accepted Jesus as, as Savior. And I'm not giving a, a case for uh, the doctrine of eternal security. He who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. But the victory is already ours, amen, if you know Jesus. But what we've been talking about in this series of messages is now the new life that God has called us to live. It's not just transformed on, on the inside as far as this new hope, this new joy, this new forgiveness, freedom from guilt, freedom from fear. There's a new way of thinking if you know Jesus, a, a new way and a new way of living, a new righteousness. And all righteousness is, is right living. I think all of us want to live right. The problem is if, if you don't know Christ, you live right according to your own eyes and not the Lord's eyes as opposed to um, righteous living. But right living and right thinking. In fact, I believe it's the book of Philippians. I don't have the scripture in front of me, so please forgive me this morning. But Paul writes, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus if you've accepted Jesus as Lord and as Savior, there needs to be a transformation process happening in your mind. And there's a reason why I say happening and not that should have happened. And the reason is this. The act of transforming our way of thinking and, and living, I have found in my life, is a lifelong process. Maybe, maybe you're different from me. Maybe the moment you got saved, you were immediately perfect. Well, I know some of you. <laughs> I, know, I know actually all of you <laughs> this morning. I know we're, there, we're works in progress, so each day we should be thinking more like Jesus and living more like Jesus and acting more like Jesus. Jesus brings it out in our main text this morning, which is, or our theme text for this series in Matthew's Gospel 9, 
Verses 16 and 17, no one puts on a patch of unshrunk cloth on a garment for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do people put a new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined, but they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. And, and just to give a, a, a quick synopsis or, or a, a quick uh, refresher, reminder of what those two verses are talking about, it's talking about if we know Jesus, and we want to prosper in the faith that God has called us to. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to transform our thinking and to transform our living in Jesus' name. And to help us understand what that is, we've been looking at, and, and this scripture is in three of the four Gospels, this new wineskins and, and new cloth and old cloth. This illustration is in three Gospels and they're preceded by three different occasions, three, three different situations that happened that, that Jesus summed up by saying, if you're going to live for me, you've got to get rid of the old ways, the ways of the law, the old way of thinking, the old way of living, and adopt the new way, the way of the Spirit, the way of grace, the way of Jesus, and the way of the Holy Spirit. And the first illustration, or the first situation that happened was the layman who was brought down through the, the, the roof in front of Jesus because the house was so full. And he was brought down because he couldn't walk. And when Jesus saw him, and the Bible says power was present to heal, Jesus immediately healed him. No, he didn't. He did heal him, but not immediately. Prior to healing this man that society would view as an outcast, maybe even being punished because he was a lame man, Jesus forgave him of each and every sin. Showing to us, number one, that there, there are no outcasts in society and there's no one whose sin is too little or too great that they don't need the forgiveness of Jesus. But number two, the most important thing Jesus is concerned about, predominantly in the world, but also in you and me, the saint, is the good work that God wants to do within us. In fact, Jesus puts it this way, better to enter him... Better to enter heaven maimed than to be condemned to hell as a whole person. God, God is willing to allow you, if it needs be, to go through a time of, of your life of, of suffering if it keeps you close to Jesus because he'd rather have you in heaven having gone through a difficult life than having your best life now and then going to hell. But also, brothers and sisters in Christ, God desires. And may I say, not only does God desire, but it is the most rewarding and fulfilling life in the Lord Jesus Christ if we allow God to bring us from a place of lesser faith to a place of greater faith, a place of lesser righteousness to a place of greater righteousness, a place from lesser love to a place of greater love. Those, those are the things. Those are part of the crowns. And I know there's a soul winner's crown. And when I say soul winner, I mean winning people to Jesus and keeping people to Jesus, both sharing and discipling. But we'll also receive a crown for the development of spiritual fruit within our lives. And then last week, we began the second situation that happened before Jesus said you can't put old, new wine into old wineskins and that's the calling of Matthew. Let's read our subtext again this morning before we pray and, and talk a little bit about that and then move forward. 
reading Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. After he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting on the tax booth, he said to him, follow me. And he, speaking of Matthew, left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him and in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's bow our hearts together and let's ask God's blessing to be with us as we worship God together. Father, we thank you so much in Jesus' name for your goodness and grace. Thank you for your love and mercy. We thank you for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst as we worship you together. Once again, as we come to the Word of God, we pray for your anointing, for we so desperately need it. Give words to this, your speaker, and give us all ears to hear what your Holy Spirit is saying. And we ask this in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. The first story talks about how there is no one that is too far from God that God cannot save them. And the second story, in a nutshell, and then I guess I'll conclude in prayer if I can put it in a nutshell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there is no one too far from God that God cannot equip, cannot empower, and use them for the glory of his kingdom. In fact, there is not only no one too far that God cannot equip and use uh, for the glory of his kingdom. God wants to use everyone. Regardless of, on what scale of righteousness or qual qualifications or strengths or weaknesses that uh, in man's eyes that you rest upon, God wants to use you and God wants to use me for the glory of his kingdom. In the Old Testament, there were just certain ones who could do certain things for the kingdom of God. We took time to talk about the priest and, and how they, they needed to be from a certain tribe. And the high priest and uh, the ministering priest, as far as offering sacrifices, they need to be of, of, of a certain family. And they need to be a certain age, 30 through 50. I think I'll go back. No, no, I don't want to go back. <laughs> Amen. Uh, talking to Greg, Greg, you know, he, he wants 15 more years. I hope God gives him 20 to serve Jesus specifically. And, uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to keep going. Amen. I hope, I, and I think we all need to keep that fostered in our heart. And they also couldn't be anyone who had any type of physical defect. You couldn't be lame. You couldn't have leprosy. You couldn't be blind. You couldn't be missing any parts of your body. If, if there was any physical blemish to you, you were unfit to be priest. And then Jesus comes along. And, and he, he picks, his name was Levi. We call him Matthew, but and I'm not sure of his lineage. He, he could have been a Levite. But certainly amongst his disciples, there were more people from the tribe of Judah than there were from the tribe of Levi. He calls a man who's not only someone who had not been trained to become a, a religious leader, a religious scholar. He called someone who was was known as a, a cheat, a collaborator. Uh, we would think, and I use these two illustrations, and please forgive me if this is your job. I'm sure you do it honorably. 
We would equate them with a politician or, or, or with a used car, you know, the slimy used car salesman with the hair, hair slicked back and, and the plaid jacket and uh, uh, the white platform shoes that I'm expecting Jim to wear sometime on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Chewing gum and saying, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> You know, no one, anyone would want to follow or anyone would like to look up to. He had none of those things. He was hated. He was an outcast. He was, he was someone that people didn't relate to. How could you be that person? How could you do those things? And not only could they not relate to him, they didn't want to relate to him. You know, there's people who do horrible things. You see in the news where people commit atrocious crimes, violent crimes. You know, one of the things sometimes me and my wife will watch a documentary and, and we'll watch people guilty of white-collar crime, like, like the Bernie Madoffs and that type of person. And, and I went, how could anyone do that? Swindle, unsuspecting, especially older people, unsuspecting, trusting, some simple-minded, swindling. I, I can't relate to you. I can't, you know, I can't get my mind around. And I don't. I don't want to think about it. And God looks, Jesus looks at him. The Lord Jesus, God in flesh, looks at him and says, follow me. And you're not just going to be a follower of me. You're going to be one of the twelve. A disciple who would later become an apostle. And, and, and a wonderful apostle. I'm not saying he's any greater than any of the other apostles. But a wonderful apostle in that God inspired him to write a first-hand account of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that you and I continue to study from and be enriched from today. This is the man God used. And so you, you and I have no excuse not to be called or... or Definitely not to be called. I mean, God does the calling. But not to be used by God. I don't know enough. People don't take me seriously. I don't have a good personality for it. No, it, God can use Matthew. And we did throw Peter in there last week as well. The coarse fisherman who always seemed to be putting his foot in his mouth. If God could use those 12 men, certainly he can use you and me. The power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is no different in us than it was those men in that day. So we looked at as far as qualifications, is really none. In fact, I love, love the fact that Brother Tom was here <laughs> and he shared how God used him. Uh, and, you know, he had quite a few things to say as far as prison ministry and evangelism. And then when I asked him, what were your qualifications to, to do in this, this ministry and, and prior to becoming saved? And <laughs> with a smile and a laugh, he said, none. <laughs> Without hesitation. In fact, you, you, if you talk to him, you should hear some of the stories that he tells before he became born again. You would think in your mind, there's no way I'm going to use that guy. And there's a crown waiting for him for his faithful service. Why? Because he allowed God to change him and to move within his heart and to move through him to others in Jesus' name. But having said that, it doesn't mean that there are no qualifications for ministry, for there certainly are. In fact, not only are, are there things that God is looking for in believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, they are far greater 
and may I say far more challenging than the qualifications that the Levites or the priests had in the Old Testament. Last week we shared about Samuel and his choosing of David to become king. And uh, as the story goes, for those of you who may not be here, don't remember the story, or not familiar, uh, God sent Samuel to a, a family headed by a man named Jesse to choose a new king for Israel. And Jesse had a number of sons, and it was from amongst, among one of these sons that God was going to choose the next king. When the first son comes out, I think his name was Eliab, and Samuel sees him, and he's everything as far as just visually what you would want from a king. He was tall, he looked strong, he was probably handsome. It was a very handsome family. He probably had an air of confidence, and from a leader you want someone with brimming with confidence as he walked strutted in. Wasn't that confident if you continue to read through the stories, another message for another time. And Samuel says in his heart, this must be the man. Look at him. What a specimen. <laughs> if he was to use words of today. A fine specimen of a man. And God says, no. I have rejected him. And the reason he rejected him, he said to Samuel, you see, I do not see as man sees. I'm not just looking, I'm not looking at, you know, how big or how confident they are, Ooh, you know, how they'll make people swoon. I am looking at the heart. Specifically, I am looking for a man after God's own heart. And it wasn't until the youngest of sons, a young, ruddy, Red-headed, freckle-faced, upstart boy named David it wasn't until he came in, until and at that point, the Holy Spirit prompted Samuel and said, "This is the one. Anoint him. He is going to lead Israel." Because he met the qualification of being a man after God's own heart. So, let us ask ourselves the question this morning. What is a man or a woman who is after the heart of God, who fulfills this requirement? I think we can see definitely it was something that God saw in Matthew's life, in Peter and James and John and the other disciples. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but before we do, let's look at Acts chapter 6 verses 2 through 4 and let's see what the early church leaders, what they were looking for. Because as the church grows, you need more people who accept Jesus to do the work of the ministry. You know, I really didn't want to make this, really wasn't initially thinking about this, but may this series of messages be a challenge to all of us to do what God has called us to do, to build the kingdom of God within our church, within our families, and within this community. Because if we don't grow, and if we're not fulfilling what God has called us to be, and I'm thankful for you being here. It's an important part of knowing Jesus to be part of God's house. But if we're not growing, and we're not assuming responsibility for God's kingdom, the church, this church will never grow. And the church will never grow. It's, it's like, a, a, you know, they always talk about how a handful of people do things. Well, you can only put so much stuff in two hands until it starts to overflow. And that's what happened in the early church. People got saved and people be, 
you know, more people started coming to the point where things weren't being taken care of properly, specifically ministry to widows. And so they needed help, and let's look at what they were looking for. So the 12, Acts 6, beginning with verse 2, the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Now, it seemed like a very simple thing as, as far as what needed to be done. There were, there were people in, in the church, widows who, who you know, Things were different back then, and, and, and so um, uh, you know, the getting of food w w was more of a challenge, and, and as brothers and sisters, we bear one, another bur one another's burdens to fulfill the law of Christ. So the church took on that responsibility from God to make sure that everyone was fed and taken care of. And so they had to find men to deliver food. Imagine if we needed to do that here in this church. What would we look for? Well, who's got a good car? Or who's got a truck? Who's got the time? Who can lift a box 60 pounds? Who's kind of friendly? Who doesn't mind, you know, going out in the rain? And those are all, you know, important things. But notice how this, the apostles weren't looking for any of those things. We need, we, we need a couple, you know, like... Setting up tables. We need a couple of beefy guys to go down there and take care of it. They knew because it was an act of, of ministry, an act of service that was to be done not just to help people out with food, but to bless people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was going to be done correctly, it needed to be people who had a heart after God. Three things I see in this portion of Scripture. That these leaders were looking for in, in these servants, these ministers of food. By the way, they just didn't deliver food. Stephen was one of them. And not only was he the first martyr, but he was a preacher, a teacher, and a worker of miracles under the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't despise doing works of service. The first thing that they looked for, or, or the three things. Number one is sincerity. Number two, communion. And number three, peace. Sincerity, communion, and peace. Where do we get that? Where do we find that here? Number one, they looked for someone with, with a good reputation. It wasn't just anyone. They wanted people who were known to be people of God. And when I say that, I, I think of the Apostles Paul conception of what it means to be a person of good reputation, where he stated, my conscience is clear before God and man. Somewhat, you know, it would be easy, especially here, Last town I lived in was 1,200, so everybody knew everybody's business. <laughs> you found out what your neighbor was doing before they actually did it. It was so small. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't even make sense. But it's very easy in our culture, in this area here, to come to church on Sunday morning and pretend to be a Christian and then live like the devil the rest of the week. And no one at church ever be the wiser to it. As not a man or a woman after God's own heart. God is looking for people of good reputation both within and outside of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now some of you might be saying, does that mean we have to be perfect? Or we should strive for perfection? 
But a man or a woman of good reputation, not only is is like Jesus and becomes more like Jesus every day because they're constantly growing, they're constantly pursuing him, they're constantly growing in him and the power of his Holy Spirit. But number two, when they make mistakes, and we all make mistakes, when we sin and we all sin, we acknowledge, we take responsibility, and we ask for forgiveness. And all of those things can be condensed in, in, into one word, I feel, at least this speaks to me and I hope it speaks to you this morning, the word sincerity. Sincerity. We live sincerely before God and man. We're not hypocrites. We're not duplicitous. Doing one thing. Living what you know, pretending to live one way, living another way. We don't talk out of both sides of our... You know what I mean this morning. Do you know people in the world, they want to hate you if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, but if you're truly living a sincere life before them, they won't agree with, with your faith, they may not agree with your politics. They may not agree with anything you do, but they will respect you and they might even come to like you. Because you are who you profess to be. Secondly, communion, and that is brought out how these men were not only to be men of good reputation, but full of the Holy Spirit. There are, I dare say, two types of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ as it relates to this point. Number one, those who have a strong relationship with Jesus because you spend time with him. You spend time in the word of God. Not just reading the word of God, meditating upon the word of God. I think we've gotten away from that. We, we, we get distracted on so many things. And I ask you this morning, do you take time during the week, every day, to just to meditate on God and the things of God? Spend time in prayer. Not only casting your cares, not only interceding, but just worshiping Jesus. And asking God to speak to your heart. The Holy Spirit still speaks today. And if you open up your heart and listen, you'll hear him. I'm not saying what frequency you will, but he'll speak to your heart. And not just when you're praying. The Bible says, you know, I believe it's in the book of Galatians. You know, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Which means, you know, if we're working on that strong relationship with Jesus, I love you, I want to spend time with you, I worship you. Teach me, O oh God, your ways. Not only will he speak to us as we're in our closets of prayer, but as we're out driving, as we're working, as we're in the yard doing shopping, whatever it might, whatever you might be doing, all of a sudden you'll hear the Spirit of the Lord speak to you. Maybe, and I'm, I'm sharing this more from experience than anything, maybe it's just, you know, a scripture that comes to mind and it just ministers so powerfully to you. Or a promise regarding some worry about your heart. Or a directive to go, hey, speak to this person. Pray for this person. Help this person. A person whose heart is after God, a person who's qualified 
for service is a person who communes with Jesus. And then the last thing, not the last point of my message, I have one other point that I will go through quickly. Actually, you don't turn into pumpkins till noon, so I have an hour actually to do that. <laughs> is a wise person. They look for people. Notice there's a distinguishing between the two. Full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And of course, wisdom is one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit. It's part of, his, if, as we read... Isaiah 11, it's part of his nature, his, his, his character. And so if we're walking in the Holy Spirit, and we're listening to the Holy Spirit, and we're spending time with the sword of God's Holy Spirit, wisdom is just going to flow out of you. Your life will be marked divine wisdom and not man's. Your life will be marked by its words and, and your words will also overflow with jewels from heaven of wisdom. You'll be making godly decisions. Sometimes they won't make sense. And many times it'll be opposite from man's wisdom, but you will, your life will be marked by godly decisions which will bear fruit for God's kingdom. And your counsel, people will actually seek you out. Because when they, they know if they talk to brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they will give, them, give it to them straight, but give it to them wise. And how this relates to peace. If you're living in God's wisdom, you don't have a care in this world because your life is established in God's strength. Uh, in, in fact, um, the Bible talks about how the world, uh, the foundation of the world are the pillars of wisdom in the book of Proverbs. People of sincerity, people of communion, people of peace. Because of their good reputation or right living, spirit-filled life, and wisdom. But lastly, and in conclusion this morning, a man or a woman who is after God's own heart is a man and woman of total, total sacrifice. Back to Matthew when Jesus came to Matthew and called him to follow him. He immediately got up, left his, the table of custom left his, his little job station and followed Jesus, just walked away from it. He did what was expected of him. Luke 9, verse 23, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross or die to himself and follow me. In fact, not just Levi, but all the disciples did the same thing. This is one of, the, one of the things Jesus was looking for, one of the things that enabled them to be the apostles. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. So were James, James, John, the sons of Debedi, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, do not fear... From now on, you will be catching men. When they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. 
I wasn't going to tell the whole story, but let me tell the whole story just real quick. They had been fishing all night. They didn't catch anything. And Jesus comes up and he says what every... I was going to say unlucky, <laughs> unsuccessful fisherman hates to hear. Have you caught anything? No. <laughs> Drop your nets. They dropped them and they pulled in a load of fish so big the boat could barely contain it. I believe it began to sink. And on... on the heels of their greatest success. Their greatest haul of fish ever. This is great. Jesus says, I'm going to make you now fishers of men. They come to the shore, they leave their boats, and then they follow Jesus. They didn't go back till much later. When I say later, it, it appears they didn't go back until after Jesus rose from the dead. And only for a short time. What is a life of sacrifice? Internally, we talked about it already. And it, it means to die to self. By the Spirit, putting to deeds, uh, putting to death the deeds of the flesh, according to Romans 8. But it's also a willingness to leave all in order to fulfill the call of the Lord Jesus Christ upon our lives. Look at what the disciples gave up to follow Jesus. The security of their present life. They may not have been rich, the fishermen, but they had something. They had the investment, the boats, the means to leave that, follow me. And they were willing to do that. There was no certainty in their future. They, Jesus didn't have a growth plan. You know, and this is where I expect to be in five years. And, and you can expect, you know, quarterly raises and so on and so forth. Rejection. People wouldn't understand what they're doing. Why are you following this man? Rejection as far as people not taking them seriously. Who's going who's gonna to follow us? We're just publicans, fishermen, sinners. Rejection because... Jesus himself said, if they hated me, they'll hate you also. And he said that relatively at the beginning of the ministry. And a willingness to adopt a dangerous lifestyle. Not that God would cause you to do anything risky as far as what the world sees. But a life that opens yourself up to the persecution of men. And the torments and the temptation of the enemy, there is a spiritual world. And let me tell you, that calling to leave everything and follow Jesus is upon each and every one who would profess the name of the Lord. And to say to a disciple to gloss over that or to not mention that at all is not to present not only the, the fullness of what it means to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, but to deny them the privilege of being set free from the mundane of the world, but more importantly, to enjoy the blessings of the Lord Jesus Christ that only comes when we live a life completely surrendered to Him. Now this morning I'm not saying that you need to all leave your jobs, leave your homes, and follow, you need to follow Jesus. I'm not saying that. But in your heart today, is there anything that if God was to say, you need to leave that in order to follow me? There might be something in your life that you put above God. 
It has your love, your attention, your adoration. And so you put that before, the, you, you come to church, you spend time reading the Bible, but it's secondary to your golf game or your fishing or your, your you know, social group or whatever it might be. God's saying, you know, that's been a roadblock between you and me. You need to lay that aside. Or there might be something God is calling you to do, but you have some type of activity, some type of engagement, and you're like, I, I, just, I just love my bridge club too much. I don't even know what bridge is. It's a card game, I guess. But I just love my bridge game too much. And for me to, you know pass out Bibles on, on a Saturday morning or, you know, I, I can't do that. We need to, if we can't be at that area, we have not reached that place of sacrifice where we are fully qualified to be servants of the Lord. Let's stand this morning. Folks, I'm